Welcome to Beyond the Scale, the show where everyday heroes tell their stories on how they turn their lives around for the healthier. I'm Coach Brittany, and today's guest is Josh Carter. He'll be talking about his own transformation story and the power of tying your emotions to your goals. Hope you enjoy. Welcome, Josh Carter. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Happy to be here. Excited to learn about your story and how you became who you are today. So Okay. Well, I hope it's interesting. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> Bet you they do as well. <laughs> so why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you currently do? Uh, I am a uh, Fit Bonnie owner, as indicated by my shirt that I wore today. Uh, I'm also Chief Marketing Officer at Fit Body Bootcamp Corporate. And so I basically, I run a boot camp where I help people uh, achieve the body and health of their dreams, which kind of been my passion for many years. I'm sure we'll get into that. And I also uh, have a passion for uh, for writing and, and creating programs that help, you know, people across across the country. So. so first, I want to take a step back and kind of talk about where you come from. So what was life like for you growing up? Well, uh, honestly, I was bigger than most kids, just, you know, physically, uh, stature-wise, I was bigger than most. But I also, uh, turned out I was, I was fatter, too. So I was, I was definitely a heavy kid. Uh, I, I have benchmarks in my, in my memory of, of certain weights. So in third grade, I weighed 100 pounds. And that's, uh, that's about, uh, what, what age is that? Like seven, eight, something like that. Um, eighth grade, I was 180. My freshman year of high school, I was 230 pounds. And by my freshman year of college, I was 270. And I'm pretty sure it got up a little higher than that. But at that point, I was, wasn't stepping on the scale anymore. So. Got it, got it. Now, how would you say that that affected your self-image? Uh, negatively. Uh, so it wasn't good. Uh, basically, I, I uh, like a lot of people, ate my emotions. And so when I was happy, I, oh, I might as well eat. When I was sad, well, I might as well eat. And so I, that's just kind of the way it, it, it panned out for me. And I could always play it off a little because I was, I was, you know, like I said, I was relatively big. And I got the whole, uh, he's big boned and, and things like that. Um, I had to wear a... Uh, you know, the husky, the husky tough skin jeans, you know, from Sears. Um, so uh, it basically, it negatively affected me. But at some point in, in, it actually happened to me my freshman year in college, I decided I wanted to hit the gym. And, uh, and I walked in there, was super intimidated. Even though I was big, uh, I was super intimidated because I really didn't know anything about it. And that was my, literally my first step into the health and fitness world. Awesome, awesome. Now, how, how did it feel when you first walked into the gym? Were you nervous, scared? Well, see, that's where I can identify with a lot of people because, again, even though I was big and, uh, you know, I looked like you know, somebody who might work out, I had no idea what I was doing. I was completely intimidated. I was afraid to ask questions. Uh, you know, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you what I did on that first day. It was, it was at UCLA, so it was at the UCLA gym that's open for all students. And at the time, it was a very small gym, and it was very crowded. And so you had to wait in line for, for whatever it is you wanted to, learn, to, to use. And uh, like I said, I was, just, I was just very intimidated. But oddly enough, I quickly fell in love with it. And so I just kept going over and over, started reading all the books that I could about it, started going, of course, with the, uh, with the muscle magazines of the day, the, the muscle and fitness and flex and muscular development and, and all of those ones. And, uh, and just it truly, it, be, it became a passion of mine. Okay. And now, what do you think it was that really made you fall in love with fitness? I think at first it was the way it made me feel about myself, about the sense of accomplishment. Because even though in the beginning I certainly didn't know what I was doing, well, I did something which was better than the day before, right? And right. it, it kind of uh, ties in with one of my tenets of, of how I live my life now, which is I always strive to be a better version of myself. Every single day when I wake up, I strive to be a better version of myself. And so back then, that made me feel better about myself, and it was doing something towards my, my health and fitness. And as it happens, I was pretty good at it, right? And so, you know, I, I learned what I could learn uh, from, from the magazines and, and from the other people. And eventually, I got a gym membership at a, at a real gym. Uh, it was a gift from my girlfriend at the time. It got me a, a membership there, and I started lifting real ways. I ended up getting a job as a personal trainer at a gym in Santa Monica. And the way that that worked was kind of funny because, again, I, I, I was big. And, and, and for me, gaining muscle is relatively easy. Losing fat is super hard. Um, but I, so I looked big, and so the, thankfully the, uh, the manager of the gym where I applied for the job didn't know what he was doing, and he just looked at me and said, oh, you must know what you're doing, and I didn't. And so he hired me, so I kind of did on-the-job training, so he kind of uh, paid me to learn to train, to train clients, and it worked out, uh, worked out pretty well. So that was, that was my first job as, as a trainer. Okay, awesome. And now at that point when you were lifting, you know, working on your fitness journey, were you also incorporating nutrition at that point? Yeah, uh, the way I looked at it was a high protein, high carb, high fat diet. Okay. <laughs> so 
<laughs> I just got to hit whatever. Uh, yeah, that didn't work out too great. Um, I was a broke college student at this point. At this point, I um, so what I would do is uh, my mom gave me a Costco card and she'd give me a couple hundred bucks to spend on food each month. And then I also had a job and so I'd use whatever money I could. So I'd go to Costco and I would buy a pallet of the cheapest tuna that they had, right? And a box of spaghetti and the generic cornflakes and um, the big gallon of ragu. And so, <laughs> so most nights my, my dinner was, was spaghetti with ragu and I'll, I'll be honest, I put cornflakes on it because why not, um, nice. right? And then my lunch most days was I, t I would take two cans of tuna with me to school and a can opener and I would open those up and I'd go to whatever cafe was around and grab a plastic spoon and literally eat the tuna straight from the can. And I remember when I started to make money, it's like I'm never eating tuna again because it, it was just one of those things. Okay, so when you started seeing results, did that change anything in your life? Did it open new opportunities or doors for you? It, it certainly did. Like I said, I, I was able to get a job training people. Now, I was going to UCLA at the time. I was getting a degree in economics, which I was really good at, just scholastically. I was, I was good at that stuff. Uh, I just didn't like it. It just wasn't, I had no passion for it. And so by the time I figured out that, wow, this working out thing is pretty damn cool, and oh my God, I can make money doing this, I was already knee deep in this, in this, uh, getting this degree. I said, well, I'm going to finish. So I still worked my way through it, but having, it certainly gave me some physical confidence. And um, I remember early on when uh, I, was, I was living with, I think she was a fiance at the time, um, we, she worked a, a normal nine to five job. She, she graduated before me, so she had a normal nine to five job. I don't remember how much she was making. And I was working as a trainer and still going to school. And I remember the day that my paycheck from my training gig exceeded hers, and yet I was working a fraction of the time. She was so pissed. And I was like, yeah, baby, I got bank. It was, you know, it was like 500 bucks, whatever. It wasn't much, but it was like I was feeling rich at the time. So it, it certainly gave me a, a, a sense of empowerment. And what I found that it's funny, the evolution of, of not just me physically, but just in, in, my, um, in, my, in my goals, in my life, in my passion. It went from me training myself to understanding that I could share that with somebody else and affect their life. And so I did that one-on-one -on -one in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Just some one-on-one -on -one training. It's like, wow, this is really impactful. I can literally help people improve their lives. And so I, you know, there's only so many clients you can have. And so then my business model changed to doing boot camps. And now I've got, you know, classes 20, 30, 40 people that are in this boot camp. Now I'm doing it on a much broader scale, and I'm able to hire trainers so that they can do it as well. And then I went on to coach other trainers on how they can do their boot camp thing. So it keeps expanding. And I've just found that my passion has, has gone along with that. So my passion has always been helping people change their lives. And I found a way to exponentially do that. And I'm always looking forward to whatever the next step will bring. Now, speaking about passion, yeah. what is what type of emotions and feelings do you feel when you are just, you know, aligned with your passion and doing what you're meant to do in life? Well, uh, what I find is that too many of us spend our lives in, in doing have to things, right? I have to go to work. I have to pay my taxes. I have to sure. all this other stuff. Uh, when you're living your passion, your life is full of get to's. Like for now, I get, I get to talk to you and doing this podcast. This is awesome. I love this stuff. So when you're living your passion, basically your life is pretty much a gift. I mean, you still got to do things that you don't want to do. Right. Sometimes you don't want to get up at 530 in the morning. I certainly never want to pay my taxes. But, you know, there's certain things that, that are always going to be that way. But my life is full of get to's. I get to have uh, the freedom to enjoy time with my children. I get to, you know, work on a, you know, on a laptop and, and create compelling uh, pieces of, of email and all this other things that will actually help people decide, you know what, I do want to take care of my health and my fitness because it is important to me. This is the only body I have, right? And that, yeah, when I am healthier, guess what? I am also happier. So it's those type of things that uh, that I get to do that help me live my passion. And also, it's, it's almost selfish because it turns out that the more I help other people, the better I feel, right? right. So I find that the more people I'm able to help, the better, the better life I get to lead. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Now, how has your personal journey with fitness helped you connect with your clients? That's a great question because a lot of times people will look at trainers and, and, and certainly me at this point and think, oh, well, you've always been in shape. And that just for me certainly is not the case. So I can identify. Now, a lot of my clients are women mm -hmm. and I've never been a woman, Correct. despite what you might have heard. <laughs> Never been a woman, but I have been overweight. 
And so I can say, yeah, you know what? I know what it's like to go and, and go to the clothing rack and, and try on a, a, pair of clothes, a pair of jeans or whatever and go, oh, man, these don't fit. I got to bump up a couple inches. So I know that pain. I know the, the pain of, of like seeing a picture of yourself and going, oh, man, that is brutal. I can't believe that's me. Or seeing a reflection in the mirror or whatever, that, that, uh, that association with not being proud of who you are. Right. And that's a, that is just not a great feeling. Mm -hmm. So I know that pain. I can identify with that pain. So when I'm talking to the client and they're sharing with me their experiences, I'm not just speaking as someone who goes, well, that's that sucks. No, I know it sucks because I've been there. And so because I've been there and found my way out of it and found a path to health and happiness, I can also direct them to find it might not be identical to mine, right. but I can help them find their path to their happiness. Because, again, I've, I've been there. Absolutely. And I think that is something that, you know, people don't think of. Men also go through the same thoughts that women go through, the negative self-talk, um, you know, just really struggling with staying positive. So I love that you share your story with your clients to help them better understand that, you know, yeah. you didn't just you weren't born like this. <laughs> the thing is. You, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Women tend to be a bit more emotional and a bit more expressive. Right. Dudes bottle it in. No, I'm fine, bro. No, you're not. Right. Because if you're, you know, if you're bigger than you like, you're not happy when you step on the scale, not happy when your pants don't fit, all that stuff. Man or woman, you're going to feel it. Right? It's going to come out somewhere. And so it might, you know, women might outwardly come out with it and be unhappy and men will internalize it. And that's not good because that can literally turn into some serious health consequences. I've been in this game long enough to be able to recognize that and help both men and women understand that that is not the way to live. And the funny thing is, a lot of people don't don't understand how bad they feel now until they feel good. If you just think that's normal, that's not normal, right? Feeling that way, feeling unhappy, feeling miserable every time you pass a mirror, see a photo, step on the scale, whatever that is, that is not a normal feeling. Being proud of yourself, being having that sense of pride and courage and confidence with every single step you take and every breath you take, that's normal. And once you, but it's hard to see from here. It's a matter of perspective. It's hard to see from here. But once you start that journey, and even if you're not there yet, you go, oh, wow, I can't believe that's how I used to feel. And I used to think that was normal. It's not. And so when we make that realization, we're able to go, if it feels this good here, oh man, I can't imagine what it's gonna feel like down here. So how do you help your own clients recognize that they are worth it, they are worth the investment for their health? Well, it is certainly a financial investment. Correct. But it's also an investment of time and effort, right? And basically the bottom line is they have to determine that what is their happiness worth? And when they feel, when they realize that being happy is worth way more money than they would ever spend, then it be, then it becomes a win-win proposition for for whatever it is they want to do. So it's about not it's not about how much it costs; it's about how much it's worth. So how much is it worth to you to be healthy and happy? Literally every moment, you know, not every moment. I shouldn't say that. Most moments Most, of the day, because yeah. your kids are still going to piss you off every now and again, and, <laughs> and there's the spouse or whatever. But uh, you know what? It, it, a lot of that's easier to take when you have one less thing on your plate. And as far as you know, your health and, and being being proud and confident in, in your own skin, being uncomfortable in your own skin. I say this from experience is is not fun. It's it's a absolutely terrible experience. Yeah, absolutely. Now, speaking of kids, you're yeah, a father. I am. Two boys, correct? Now, how do you help incorporate health and fitness into their lives? I've tried to impart in them the sense that being healthy and fit is just part of our everyday lives. And I've asked them to kind of make that decision. And so through the course of things they've done through like karate and they've done uh, baseball and uh, soccer and a couple other physical activities. Now they're both old enough. I have 11 year old and a 15 year old that they like to work out with me. Oh, nice. And so now they actually come and train with me. Uh, three, four days a week, depending on various whatever school activities are going on. And they absolutely love it. And they're both in phases, and I hope they don't see this, where they kind of want to be like dad. So I'm working that to my advantage. <laughs> Since, yeah, dad, I want, when are my arms going to be as big as yours? Oh, yeah, any day. Uh, so uh, we keep working that. Because at some point, you know, who knows? They might skew and, and not think dad's so cool anymore. But right now, I'm trying, trying to work on that. And so, um, you know, uh, with my younger son, who who uh, tends to physically resemble me uh, as far as just being a little bit uh, 
Husky, Stocky, whatever. Uh, so we both use the same nutrition tracking app. So we're having a lot of fun. We actually have fun tracking our nutrition. Oh yeah, how many carbs did you get today? Did you hit your protein goal? Awesome, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of a it's kind of a fun thing. So it's not a ha it's, again it's not a, a have to. Right. It's a get to. Right. So they get to work out with me. And and Nate really likes uh, likes tracking his app. And he sends me screenshots. Look, Dad, I hit it perfectly. You know. So there's it's a sense of pride with him. And so um and and both boys have different goals. Like oh I got to deadlift 200 today. And and so um. It's become a part of our everyday life, and as it happens, we also do physical activities on the weekends. We uh, we do mountain biking. We do uh, we tend to really like hiking, so we do that a lot. You know, trips to the beach, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I love that you guys incorporate that all together, and you're able to work out as a family. Yeah, it's not just, yeah, obviously it's not just the gym. It's taking yeah. you know that for me that's fun. That's certainly therapy time for me as well. But it's uh, taking that physical fitness that you that you that you create and applying it to your outward life to do fun things, so that you're not too tired to go out and you know run around with them on the weekends or whatever. Just play in the backyard or throw the ball around or run with the dog or whatever you do. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how has fitness impacted your mindset? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a back and forth thing because one of, the, one of the things one of my coaches once said to me is how you do anything is how you do everything. So if there's, and there's certain things you can control and certain things you right. can't control. And there's a lot in our everyday lives that you can't control. You can't control what your boss is going to tell you, what your spouse is going to tell you, uh, the traffic, uh, the weather, you know, whatever. There's, there's tons. And it's going to, in some way, affect your life. But there's some things that you have direct control over. So one of the things you have direct control over is what you put in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Nobody's shoving food in my mouth recently. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody's shoving food in my mouth, right? <laughs> right. And so I'm the only one who does that. So I have direct control over that. And I also have direct control over how many times a week I work out. With exceptions, occasionally you blow out a tire or whatever. Right. But for the most part, I have direct control over that. Now, what I don't have direct control over is, say, for instance, what happens to the scale, right? Mm -hmm. Not direct. But I have direct control over the things that affect what happened to the scale. So I'm going to control what I can control. So that means my, my nutrition and my, my workouts. And that will have indirect uh, control over what happens to the scale or whatever your goal happens to be, lift, you know, deadlifting this or right. shrinking your waist that or whatever those things are. But I can apply those control uh, habits that I've created and apply those towards, towards my business life, to my life with relationships, and control what I can in those environments and accept those things that I can. Yeah, so for sure, you know, life has its up and downs, like you mentioned, can only control certain things. Right. When you are like on a down slope yeah. and, you know, you're finding yourself in a negative mindset, how do you overcome that? Okay, so there's an old Japanese saying that says, fall down seven times, get up eight. And the thing to realize is that, let's, let's talk about eating. Occasionally, you're gonna screw up and have, uh, you know, a giant burrito and a milkshake and a sundae or whatever your thing is, right? You're gonna, you're gonna just blow it and you're gonna, oh man. So there's two things you can do. You can, I'm a loser, I might as well just keep doing this. That's one path. Or you can pick yourself up, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, acknowledge the mistake, and move forward. Now, one of the key things in, in acknowledging the mistake is find out if there was a trigger. What, what made, how did I get there? Right. What made me do that, right? So try to learn from the mistake. Because if you're not learning from the mistake, most likely you're gonna have it happen right, again. Right. So if you can identify, oh, you know what? I'm, when, when my boss yelled at me, or my kids acted up or whatever, I retreated to the refrigerator and, and dug in or grabbed the bottle of wine or you know, grabbed the haagen or whatever your thing is, right? Uh, so it was the, this that triggered that. So maybe a better thing to do in that situation is this, right? Mm -hmm. So you take your attention and, and, and uh, you know, aim, it, aim it elsewhere. Focus your attention where it deserves. Focus your attention on habits and activities and actions that serve you as opposed to ones that don't. But you got, the key is going back and recognizing the trigger. And sometimes there isn't one. Sometimes you just, oh, you know what, I, I messed up. Okay. Acknowledge the mess up. Don't beat yourself up about it. Right. Because that's not going to help. How's, how's beating yourself up going to help you learn? It's not. So you don't beat yourself up about it. Acknowledge it. Yep. Screw up. I'm not going to do that again because now I know why and now I can move forward. I love that piece of advice, and I think that's great for our listeners to incorporate into their lives to really, you know, when you screw up or you fall off track, just find that trigger, figure out what's going on, um, so that way, you know, it won't likely happen again. So thank you for sharing that, Josh. All of us. Everybody. Every single one of us. Yeah. Everybody Me screws included. up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It happens. Now, do you still struggle with self-image? Uh, yeah, I'll be honest. Uh, I am currently 46 years old, uh, and... 
long ago. We, we get things knocking around in our brains, right? right? Some, some, maybe something, you know, a lot of times it's what our parents said to us, and, and maybe not intentionally, whatever, but we let these things rattle around in our heads. And so for me, I had a stepfather who called me fat and lazy. Mm. And this was probably when I was eight, so this is, you know, 30 some, 38 years ago, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It still rattles around in there. And so I still, when I go to the beach, have to remind myself I'm not that fat little kid whose, whose stepfather made fun of him. Uh, I'm an adult and I don't, those, those are essentially lies. Those are lies that, that we have been told and lies that we've repeated in our heads and we all have something, right? And so that's one of mine that rattles around in my head and it gets repeated. And the thing is, if we're not careful, we'll find reasons to validate it. Oh yeah, I sat on the couch yesterday and played a video game for an hour, he, he was right, right? That'll rattle around in there. But if you can flip that around and tell yourself uh, you know, what are essentially truths, um, you can make those validate those as well. So I am, I am not fat and lazy. Those are two things I'm not. I, I'm certainly not overweight any longer, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not lazy. I actually take action on, on the things that I want to achieve in my life. So occasionally I need to rerun that. The thing is we have these, these pathways that have been you know, through years of, of, of uh, repeating, these pathways in our brains that fat and lazy, fat and lazy, right? And it's like a, like a stream. And even though I have redirected it, nope, that's not right, the rut is still there. And if I let it, that water will go back down that path because mm. it never goes away. So I keep the water diverted to this new pathway of a strong, confident, empowered, um, you know, uh, action taker, all those things down this way. But occasionally if you let it, it'll, it'll flow. Oh, no, no, no. Get it back over there. So I have to be aware of that. And when those, when I hear those thoughts start creeping up, mm -hmm. I realize that's not me and it probably never was me. And there's no reason why that should affect me. And so I can divert it, get it back towards the uh, positive. And I would imagine the more positive thinking you have, it makes those pathways deeper. So that way the water keeps running that way and then it's easier to keep the water. Absolutely right. That way. I find that it has happened less and less over time as I was consciously aware of it. Because your, your past actions, your, I'm sorry, your past does not need to define you. What has happened to you in the past does not affect what you do in the future unless you let it. Absolutely. And I won't give that particular thing permission to affect me anymore. So how do you help people find that same passion for fitness that you have in their own lives? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I don't necessarily expect them or want them to have the same passion for fitness because a lot of people don't necessarily want fitness as much as they want the things that fitness can give them. Mm -hmm. The freedom, mm -hmm. the, 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 the self-confidence. Maybe they'll fall in love with it and that's cool too. I have a, you know, a ton of people coming to my gym. Oh, I hate going to the gym. Oh, good news, we're not a gym. All right, that's, that's good news number one. And two, we are not, you know, not your typical workout. And when you do this, you're actually gonna fall in love with it. I mean, that's, that's typically what happens. And so they fall in love with the experience that we create, which is in part a workout, but it's actually kind of a minor part. And as it happens, we concentrate on creating a feeling and an experience that is above and beyond anything that they would get anyplace else. Because here's the deal, that's the, rea that's the reality here, is that they can go to YouTube and get a workout. They can also get a nutrition program. A little Googling, done for you, right? Mm -hmm. but, when they, the, but when they come to us, that, that is only a small piece of what they get. They get this magnificent experience. We know their name when they walk in the door. We know their husband's name, their, their kids' names, what they do for a living. We know all of this stuff and we f make them feel loved and appreciated and validated every single time that they come in. And so it's a place where they come and they can't wait to get here and they don't want to leave. And when we do that, lives change. So they might not have a passion for fitness as it were, but the experience of coming in and the, and the effects that it has on their overall life, that's what we try to create so that they want to come back. And so you know, again, it's the only body that they have. So if results is a side effect of creating this experience, then that's what I'm going to do. Awesome. Now I would imagine that you know, having that type of wow experience with everyone, it also creates a sense of accountability um, in those programs. Can you talk to us about how important it is to have accountability in your life? Well, again, going back to the thing, nobody's putting food in my mouth. Uh -huh. I, I try to impart the same thing to them. Hey, the only one who is responsible for where you are in your life right now is you. So. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to ask you for your nutrition logs. I'm going to ask you how many times you came in this week. I'm going to ask you for all that stuff to make sure you are being held accountable, not to my goals or my standards for you, for your standards for you. You have told me this is what you want to achieve. So I'm going to hold you to that. 
right? So I'm going to make sure you're keeping your own promise, again, not to me, but to yourself. So I do a lot of follow-up with text and Facebook message and post. We have a private Facebook group that we use. We do all those things, phone calls. We do one-on-one -on -one meetings just to make sure that people are uh, keeping themselves accountable uh, for their own actions. And when we do that, you know, uh, people are appreciative. You know, if I, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm, you know, and somebody holds me to it, great, because that's what I, there's a reason I said it, and it's because I meant it. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine it builds confidence too, you know, when they complete those smaller goals. So absolutely. Perfect. So now do you help your clients set goals? Absolutely. Now, generally they come to me with some sort of goal in mind. So let's say that someone comes to me and says, I want to lose 20 pounds. Okay. But what we try to uncover is what's the real reason that you want to lose 20 pounds? We have to find the deeper why. So when, and I've been doing this a long time, and it is never about the 20 pounds. It's never about that number. If you go deeper and deeper each time, what we find is that it's not the 20 pounds, it's that 20 pounds ago, she was happy. 20 pounds ago, she had confidence. 20 pounds ago was before the kids. 20 pounds ago, her husband was looking at her this particular way. 20 pounds ago, she was fitting in these jeans and felt great about it. So there was some level of happiness and confidence that was 20 pounds ago, and that's why it, that's why it is. So we, when we uncover the actual why, we're able to better dial in the desire and the determination to achieve that goal. Now, again, let's go back to um, uh, not having direct control. So. One of the things we do is we, we set these, what we call procedural goals. Okay. So for instance, okay, I want to lose 20 pounds. Okay, you don't have direct control over that, but let's do a short-term goal. So let's come up with three, you know, I'll say, let's come up with three short-term goals. Okay, uh, what can I do that will have, you know, some, I'm going to give up soda. Okay, you have direct control over that. All right, no more sodas. Great. Well, maybe we need to find a substitute. We can, we can work on that. I'm going to come to the gym three times this week. You can also have direct control over that. I'm going to turn in my nutrition logs to my trainer three times this week. And now again, maybe they're great, maybe they're bad, I, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but you were able to, to work on setting those, those short-term goals so that we can go over them and then achieve what the long-term goal with the long-term goal being the 20, uh, the 20 pounds or, or whatever it happens to be. So by setting those short-term uh, achievable and uh, uh, controllable goals, we're better, better able to help our clients achieve their results. Okay, and now speaking of goals, do you think there's a difference between just thinking your goals in your head and actually writing them down on paper? I like doing both. So I like people to write down their goals in the morning and in the evening. I, I, I encourage my clients to do gratitude journals so they write what they're grateful for in the evening and also what, what they're going to achieve. I write it. I have them write it as if it has already happened. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I currently weigh uh, wh whatever the number is that is 20 pounds less than what they already are because the mind doesn't know the difference, right? right. And so it will help them achieve that. But I also encourage them to visualize what's it going to be like when you're 20 pounds lighter? Who will you be? And you have them play that in. You can walk down that beach confidently. You'll be able to zip up your skinny jeans and they'll actually be a little bit loose. You'll pass by the mirror and go, man, I look awesome. Or see a Facebook photo of yourself and I have them play these movies in their head. See a Facebook photo of yourself and go, I can't believe how great I look, right? And so have the heads turn when you walk into a room, you know, that people haven't seen you in a while, things like that. So I have them visualize what their lives will be like once they have achieved their goals. Because there's the analytical side of our brain that says, if you're 20 pounds overweight, that's a health risk, and it could lie to, you know, lead to diabetes and cancer and stroke and all these wonderful things. That's very analytical, and the analytical brain never wins. What wins is the emotional side of the brain. So when we tie our goal to an emotion, which is how awesome it'll be when I achieve this, how good I will feel on the inside, how confident and strong and happy I will be, when we apply that to our goal, that emotion, when we tie the emotion to the goal, then we're much better able to achieve it and we're much more likely to stay on the path towards success. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that. That was so powerful. Now, kind of wrapping it up here, yeah. I wanna know, what does living beyond the scale mean to you? All right, so if we take it kind of literally, uh, people shouldn't necessarily be tied up on what the number on the scale is. Because if you look at, I, I weigh 240 pounds, and that on most uh, you know, insurance and health charts puts me in an obese category. So the scale really isn't necessarily reflective of my health or, or certainly not reflective of who I am. I am not the number on the scale, right? Mm -hmm. That is not who I am. It's one piece of a much larger uh, puzzle that, that I need to put together to achieve my health and happiness. But it's you know more along lines of, of things like I had a client who told me he wasn't able to get his wedding ring on oh. because he was so heavy and so it was after 10 years he was not able to get it on oh. and so after doing a short-term six-week program with me he was able to get it on for the first time in 10 years stuff like that they're non-scale victories that are just huge being able to slip back into a dress I had a client 
whose goal was to fit in a dress. Uh, she had to do a black tie event uh, at, a, at a, some, some Christmas function or something like that. And she wanted to fit in a dress that, she, that was actually her high school prom dress from 15 years wow. and two kids ago. And she was able to do that. So awesome. it's those non-scale victories that mean so much to me, especially when I see my clients achieve them. And that when I see that they are proud, I feel proud. Well, thank you for sharing, Josh, and thank you for being on the show today. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. To all of our listeners out there, remember you can start today by finding those triggers whenever you're having negative thoughts and start replacing those with positive thoughts. Um, Josh, if any of our listeners want to visit your location, where can they find you? I am conveniently located in West Hills, California. We're on the corner of Roscoe and Fallbrook. If you happen to be in town, come and see us. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search uh, Carter Fitness and Fit Body Boot Camp is the name of my facility. And uh, that should do it. Okay. And for anyone that's not in that area, but you're still interested in Fit Body Boot Camp, you can check out fitbodybootcamp.com to find a location near you and claim your three free workouts. Well, thank you for being on the show and sharing your story today, Josh. I hope to have you back soon. Thank you. Did you know that you could have done a full workout in the amount of time it took you to listen to this podcast? Go to fitbodybootcamp.com to claim your three free sessions now. And remember to join me next Tuesday so you can see who our special guest is. Until then, remember to live a fit body, fit mind forever.